Okay, I know some people are still coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our One School House Wednesday Academic Leaders Webinar. I'm Brad Rathgiver, the Head of School and CEO of One School House, and I get the pleasure of being joined today by my friend and colleague, James Palmieri. Hi, James. Hi, Brad. Thank you for having me, uh, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon on this East Coast and morning uh, on the West. Um, take a moment to introduce myself, James Palmieri. I serve as Executive Vice President at NBOA, the National Business Officers Association, uh, which is the organization that provides professional development and networking opportunities for the CFOs and other school business personnel at your schools. In full uh, uh, transparency, I have the honor of also serving as board president uh, in a partnership with Brad and his team at One Schoolhouse, and that is a true honor and privilege. So thanks for having me here today, Brad. Thank you, James. And prior to working at NBOA, um, James is, slash can I still say is James, is an academic leader himself. Um, he has received his doctorate in education and worked previously at Trinity Hall School on the Jersey Shore. Uh, and at my grandmother's alma mater school, uh, Kent Place School in Northern New Jersey. So James, I think brings a really wonderful, unique perspective to the conversation we're gonna have today because he works extraordinarily closely on the finance and operations side of schools right now and has served as an academic leader as well. Before we jump into this conversation, perhaps as a starting off place for the conversation, just a couple of quick reminders. On our blogs, on our blog right now, Liz has wrote, written a nice piece about finances and operations for everyone, ways that academic leaders can engage in the finance and operations at their school. Next week, we're focusing on enrollment management and talking about the strategic importance of the work between academic leaders and uh, enrollment management. I'd also note as we go along, we want to make sure that we save plenty of time for questions. If you have questions for James as we go along today, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A. We use the Q&A function of, uh, of Zoom in order to make sure we keep track of questions. And as a jumping off point today, James, um, we asked in yesterday's Pulse uh, newsletter question, what's your comfort level with school finances and operations? What we didn't tell folks is that we actually asked this question back in April of 2021 as well so that we could see if there was a little change or a little difference in, in how people were perceiving their comfort level. And the good news is that academic leaders are finding themselves much more comfortable with finances and operations. So back in April, 20% said that they were very comfortable. Now it's 29%. 35% uh, in April said that they were comfortable. Now it's 52%. So now we're talking about three quarters of folks in academic leaders positions feeling comfortable or very comfortable with finance and operations at their schools. Well, now only 19% saying that they are uncomfortable. James, I, I wonder if you have any comments on this or any thoughts uh, on why this shift is happening or just excitement that it is happening. Yeah, I would start uh, by saying it's refreshing, uh, yeah. but I'm gonna get to that in a minute. I think first of all, uh, it's proof that um, this is not uh, unattainable information. Uh, this is merely the reality that in past decades, academic leaders were on one side of the school's operation and business leaders were on the other side of the school's operation. And I think uh, what has happened really since the prior um, uh, uh, real major impact to independent schools, which was the financial crisis of 2008 through 2010-ish, uh, when uh, a, a stronger partnership was built. And the business leaders and academic leaders have had to work more hand in hand uh, to regain the school's footing uh, and to prepare for the 21st century. Uh, and even more so over the past uh, two years uh, in this COVID pandemic where uh, CFOs and business offices had to support academic leadership in new ways and vice versa to try to keep schools open, operating, showing their value uh, during these really challenging times. Thanks, James. And let's let's jump into this, although I've forgotten one other piece of housekeeping too. Uh, if you uh, need or want closed captioning for this webinar, you can access that uh, by clicking the closed captioning button on Zoom. So James, let's start out uh, in uh, by talking about just 
revenues and expenses. Um, we know that school finances can sometimes seem pretty complex for academic leaders. Um, but in their essence, it's really just about understanding where the revenue for the school comes from and what drives expenses. So can you start by just talking about what those drivers are in independent schools? Absolutely. Um, I'd like to break it down into four important things to be aware of. One is the annual operating budget as it relates to the school's revenues, the dollars it brings in. Two is um, operating budget in relation to the school's expenses, the dollars that go out. Three, we'll touch on briefly, is the role of the endowment. And four would be long-term projections and financial sustainability. There's a lot of talk about that right now, not only in K through 12 independent schools, but also in higher ed. I'm gonna focus on the first two, operating budget revenue each year. We have to understand that if we're looking at a pie chart, approximately three quarters of the pie will be uh, net tuition and revenue dollars. So we are very uh, much tuition dependent organizations. We charge tuition, uh, we collect tuition, we use those dollars to pay for our operations. Um, so uh, when we're talking about three quarters of our income being tuition dependent, notice I use the word net. Gross tuition is what our sticker price is. That is what parents and families see when they consider our schools. Net is what we actually bring in. And there's a big difference. I'm gonna talk about uh, that in two ways. One is we create two gaps to get from our gross tuition to our net tuition. First of all, in general, most of our schools charge less tuition sticker price than it costs to operate the school. So whereas we may charge a tuition of $35,000 of tuition and fees, it may actually cost our school approximately $40,000 per student to actually run the business. So that's the first gap we create. The second gap we create is by offering tuition discounting. And we do this for all the right reasons, to diversify our student body, to make sure that our schools are accessible uh, for families at all income levels, uh, and to attract the best, uh, retain the best and graduate the best students possible. And so between the two gaps, um, we our net tuition is a lot less than our gross tuition. And that is where our uh, business challenges really begin. I'll pause there, Brad. Did, uh, did I provide enough clarity on the revenue side? That provides a lot of clarity. And James, I'm so glad that you went into the difference between gross tuition and net tuition, and then also talked about the gaps that we create. I know that it surprises a lot of folks who are in academic leaders' positions to know that three quarters, 80%, sometimes, sometimes much higher percentage of the revenue that we bring in at schools is tied to tuitions. Folks often think that a much greater percentage of the revenue comes from a school's endowment draw, but that's really not the case anymore, is it? No, uh, the reality is the endowments that our schools have are uh, all over the spectrum. So um, when we create the gap in between what we bring in versus what it costs to operate our schools, there's uh, primarily three buckets from which we can pull to fill that gap and to end the year in a positive position, in the black, if you will, versus in a deficit position uh, in the red. First and foremost is the endowment uh, for a lot of schools, <laughs> not for all. So just for example, um, a school with a hundred million dollar endowment, there are some of those, um, a school with a $10 million endowment, a $1 million endowment, uh, in general, they're allowed to spend about 4% of that each year to help fill the gap. So a school with a $100 million endowment using 4%, it's about $4 million to support their school's operations each year. $10 million endowment at 4%. $400,000, that's a big difference. And not only what sits on the balance sheet, that, that 100 million versus the 10 million, it's how much it spins off to support the school uh, each year. 1 million, $40,000, zero, of course, zero. So endowment is one. The second, of course, we have 
very significant school advancement or development fundraising offices, and they are truly helping the school operate each year through the annual fund efforts that occur uh, for all members throughout the community. That is, um, in, in most schools, the number two way uh, to fill out that pie chart uh, after tuition revenue. Um, annual events support that as well. Capital campaigns are different. Uh, they support the school's capital expenditure, such as renovating or adding uh, new buildings or setting up new endowment funds. Um, last, and perhaps least, uh, in a lot of cases, is auxiliary services. So yes. schools uh, do bring in dollars for before and after school programs, summer programs, faculty housing, the bookstore, all those types of things we consider auxiliary. And they help, um, but they uh, are uh, not nearly as substantial as anything related uh, to trying to collect what it costs to educate each child. And, and some of that too, James, for those that have been involved in independent schools has changed over time. Um, it used to be that uh, endowment and advancement services were, part, or were a larger, part of, larger percentage of that pie. But as schools started to increase tuition at a rate a couple of ticks above inflation year after year after year, it, it just meant that tuition was going to be a larger percentage of that pie over time. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we've set ourselves up for this with the business model that we run, um, which is some, some, some would consider broken. Don't get me wrong, it works for a lot of schools, but here are some reasons why it's challenging. I'm gonna use a few notes to make sure I make my points here. Um, we don't always just charge what it costs we benchmark against others in our market. So we're looking left and right to see what others are charging. And we come up with a number that doesn't necessarily match with our financials. Um, we charge less than it costs in many cases. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a challenging business to run. Not many organizations or businesses sell their products for less than what it costs. So um, let's look at the other side of the table, which is uh, the expenses. Uh, tuition comes in. At three quarters of the pie, it's approximately going out for uh, faculty and staff salary and benefits at an equivalent portion. It ranges somewhere between 60% or 80% of a school's annual expenses is generally going to support the school's biggest assets. Um, it's uh, adults on, on campus that are uh, running the academic program, uh, running uh, the operations. And so, um, Nibbling at the expenses in terms of uh, supplies in the classroom, cutting a field trip, that's really not going to make a dent in a lot of ways. And so the importance of the partnership between the academic leader and the school's business leaders uh, is really to focus on strategies related to managing um, uh, faculty growth uh, and how we deploy um, our professionals to uh, to carry out our programming and conduct our school's mission. That's great. To to uh, to, uh, to really get at that are all uh, things that will probably make academic leaders nauseous. Um, they're not fun things to talk about. Um, aside from some innovative things, Brett and I will talk about briefly. What I'm talking about is increasing the number of students per classroom. No one loves to do that. Yep. Increasing teaching load. No one loves to do that. Increasing uh, employee contributions for benefits. Less sweetening the deal. Again, these are, these are horrible things, but these are the realities of really trying to make an impact on that end of the pie. Reducing faculty FTE, reducing, reducing staff or admin FTE, uh, decreasing planned salary increases reducing salaries and benefits. So uh, it's a really challenging thing to manage because they're all people oriented and we are people oriented communities. Um, so uh, these are, uh, to answer Brad's original question, the things that I think are most important for academic leaders to know uh, and to have open conversations with other school admin who focus on other areas. So this is, this is a really important point, James, because it, it speaks to the role, the, the direct impact that academic leaders can make. You just noted uh, the key levers that a school has in changing its financial position. And what I didn't hear in there 
um, in what you said is reducing the field trip budget or talking about bringing down departmental expenses or anything like that. That's just not a lever that schools can really use to be effective in changing a school's financial position, is it? No, uh, my colleague uh, and your colleague, uh, MBOA's president and CEO, Jeff Shields, uh, likes to refer to that as nibbling around the crumbs of the pie. Uh, and yeah, a few dollars here and there are certainly going to help, uh, but it's not going to impact the, the business model in the long run. And so um, really getting tuition pricing and tuition discounting right, and really getting faculty and staff um, composition and compensation right are really the uh, most key elements of running the school business. So my guess is, as I ask this next question, this is gonna, this is gonna feed right in here. So during the COVID pandemic, academic leaders and business officers worked with each other as they never had before. Air filtration systems, right? Increasing financial aid, all these wonderful things that we had to work on together. So you've worked on both sides of the table. Um, I've got kind of a double barrel question for you here. The first is, what are some of the most effective ways that academic leaders can partner with the business office? And then the second part of the question is, what do you wish you knew when you were sitting on the academic leader side of the conversation back at Kent Place and Trinity Hall that you now know um, from your experience working with business officers at MBOA? Yeah, uh, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think this, was, uh, this happened over time, right? So uh, up until the, um, the financial crisis I mentioned earlier what is what we refer to as the golden age of independent schools. Uh, enrollments were healthy, schools were growing, tuition pricing um, jumps each year were um, fairly significant, but managed by the school community. It was a good and healthy time. And then everything changed. And during the 10 year period between 2010 and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I think it's fair to say that the business officer could no longer shrug their shoulders and say, I don't know anything about the program. And then the head of school and academic leaders could no longer shrug their shoulders and say, uh, I know nothing about the finances. Uh, this, a, a true um, partnership has developed, which is why many schools have engaged more budget managers in their annual budgeting process. So I would imagine that everyone that's listening to this webinar is engaged in um, some level of budget management, whether it be for their entire faculty and staff, or for a specific division or a department. And that's key, because it gets you involved in the process, a partner in stewarding the school's financial resources effectively. And we're, we, uh, I think we've learned not to only advocate for our department or for our division, um, but to advocate together on how best to manage the total uh, resources of the school to fulfill its mission. And, uh, I'm going to refer to some notes here, but I'd like to share some uh, takeaways regarding what I think are key elements of a successful partnership. Uh, some of this stem from uh, an article uh, I co-wrote with uh, Tim Fish in NAIS Magazine, and it was regarding the business officer and head of school partnership, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's academic leaders and school business leaders because it's no one person sitting in these seats. First and foremost, uh, partnering and breaking down silos. Um, we talked about that at length already. Uh, sit on the same side of the table as partners and keep challenges and opportunities on the other side of the table. We're doing this together. We're addressing challenges and opportunities together. Uh, three, welcome the constraints, the budget constraints as drivers of innovation. Mm. Organizations like One Schoolhouse, NAIS, MBOA, your state and regional associations are trying to highlight uh, schools that are doing unique and remarkable things, not so that you do the same thing, uh, but so that you think about your business and new lights and maybe start uh, innovations of your own. Uh, four is developing an unawareness and awareness and appreciation for each other's leadership styles. So a lot more schools are engaging in uh, leadership assessments, such as the DISC, or Clifton Strengths, other ways to uh, uh, get a better understanding of your colleagues and maybe think about that as you conduct your work together. Um, business officers need to bring financial statements to life. They can't simply share numbers and expect the community to understand them. They need to explain them and explain their impact. 
And similarly, academic leaders uh, need to have comfort in knowing that business officers can be trusted. Uh, yeah. They are partners uh, and they want to say yes when they can to your requests. Um, but I think it's their job to be educators in the process as well. I will dump these in the chat after I'm finished with a few more. Okay. I think they're strong takeaways. Um, academic leaders, think about how you might engage your business leaders in school activities. Um, most of these folks have unique uh, secondary skills and business officers that are most successful are generally ones that teach a course, coach a team, uh, lead an activity group. And so uh, have those conversations as well. We encourage uh, school CFOs to get out of their office as much as possible. Uh, academic leaders on the other side of that should learn basic business practices like you're doing today like the um, folks that take our budget needs mission course get engaged in these discussions. Uh, and as a result, last but not least, is that academic leaders and business officers can both bring data to the table mm. and use it effectively together to make decisions. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, and perhaps even collect and share that data together too, right? Absolutely. So uh, I also want to just note something that MBOA does fantastically. To those of you that are not as familiar with the work of MBOA, know that James and Jeff and Jennifer Hillen and the wonderful team over at MBA is constantly saying to business officers as well, make sure that you engage in the academic life of the school. That is a primary message that they send to business officers regularly. So just as you're hearing that message today, hey, Make sure that you engage with the business operations team. Know that the fine folks at MBOA are doing the same for business officers to engage in the academic life of the school. So James, I've got two more questions uh, and, uh, and, and uh, just eight minutes left, but happy to be interrupted by any questions that other folks have. So please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A. My first question for you is at MBOA, you've been thinking a lot about what we can learn from the COVID pandemic. Can you share what you've learned, what some silver, silver linings might be? Um, and if there are any ways that you're really already seeing we can innovate for the future? Sure. Um, I'm gonna list, you know, given our time constraint, several off, not get into too much detail. Uh, but in terms of what we've learned, one is that in, in many markets, there was an untapped market of families that were able to pay for independent education, but didn't see the value previously. Uh, these are families that thought they were being well served uh, by uh, lesser cost parochial schools or public schools who didn't see the value in some of the tuition prices that we charge. And yet, when we pivoted quicker than our counterparts, when we delivered better uh, online learning during the pandemic, we demonstrated that value. Um, we're starting to trend back to normal now. And so uh, retention is going to be key. We need to keep these families. We need to continue to attract new families who are willing and able to pay for independent education. And that starts with providing value. Uh, two is we learned that uh, a lot of schools didn't have uh, enough cash on hand. They had investments, they had endowment. Um, they're fairly healthy, but not cash available to get through this rough patch. And what, about, what I mean by that is that a lot of schools brought in additional students. Their enrollments grew. And yet their bottom line actually um, went down, meaning that they may have ended the year in less of a profit or even a deficit because of all the different expenses that we uh, didn't know were coming. Uh, mm. Putting up uh, tents outside to hold outdoor classrooms, changing indoor facilities, testing, uh, everything related to COVID uh, pandemic management. And so we need to get those expenses back in order. James, that's interesting to me because that includes even some of the PPP money that schools, uh, even with an infusion of cash from PPP money, you still saw that. Uh, yeah, and how that was accounted for later in the year um, was uh, um, uh, a work in progress for a lot of schools. Gotcha. Um, but some of this was some self-reporting that we did via the surveys like you conducted uh, today. Um, so we talked about uh, the market, we talked about cash, and our operating budget. Um, I think what business officers are trying to be a better partner in at the moment is uh, wellness. Wellness for every single person on campus. Um, they are often the leaders of your school's human resources department or the human resources leader 
reports to the CFO. And everyone is aware of the challenges that teachers and academic leaders are facing in these times. Uh, never mind the students, um, their parents, uh, and everyone going through this pandemic together. So an increased emphasis on uh, wellness programming, resources to support employees, um, resources on campus support students uh, is of utmost priority. And it's something that our business officers are currently talking about more than you would think uh, in terms of their total job description. And that's a key quick area for partnership, right? As, as we start to see this, this great resignation continue, um, working with the business office and corresponding HR offices in order to combat teacher burnout is a huge place for collaboration. Yeah, and, and similar to uh, wellness is diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, and, and belonging. Um, our uh, business leaders want to be not only those who can allocate resources to support growth in these regards, they um, very much should be a seat at the table in, in outlining uh, areas of importance in carrying out um, plans and programs uh, to, to elevate the school in these manners. Um, you've seen them uh, elevate their role on campus and how uh, schools have been kept operating and safe. Um, uh, they want to do that um, on an ongoing basis as well. Great. Um, some silver linings I'll share briefly. Uh, we proved to ourselves we were more, nim more nimble and agile uh, than we thought we were. Um, our uh, communities didn't always have the best uh, um, uh, uh, um, impression that we could we could innovate quickly, that we could move quickly, and we did that, and that was a great uh, proof to ourselves. The strength of our communities came through, um, proving that we were more than bricks and mortar uh, institutions. Uh, we were able to build community even from afar, and perhaps ways better than ever. Um, there was an increased level uh, of participation in governance and parent engagements hmm. by bringing those engagements online. We also saw that, of course, with virtual open houses and growing the school's enrollment. Uh, some of those um, capacities need to remain. And while we welcome folks back on campus, uh, keeping some of those virtual doors open will be key. Uh, we are using our campuses and facilities in more unique and creative ways. And we are learning and hopefully um, moving towards understanding that remote work is a viable and flexible option for our schools to attract top talent. We have been very inflexible given our calendars, our schedules, our FTE expectations. And yet um, there are so many wonderful folks out there, be it from afar, be it online, be it in a part-time or adjunct capacity who could support our programs and support our mission without being new additional FTEs that are requiring 100% salary and benefits. That's, that's a really key point because I think that that's a place where academic leaders struggled a little bit too, um, and particularly with faculty. I think what you're pointing to there is that there's an opportunity perhaps to think about things a little bit differently, if not with teaching faculty in the classroom, perhaps with support staff or administrative positions. I know some schools were playing around with that at the edges before for uh, the COVID pandemic, but, but that's becoming a reality of, uh, of life uh, as we continue through the pandemic too, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, um, what uh, academic leaders and teachers have done to keep our schools operating at such a high level has been uh, extreme. Uh, and we need to keep that momentum going as we think about um, reinvigorating, reinventing our programs for the years that will follow. Um, so uh, kudos to all of you for you and your great work. Uh, and um, I appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you, Brad. Is there anything that we uh, didn't cover that you hope? You know, the only other thing that I'll mention is as a place for collaboration between the business office and academic leaders is that in my experience, business officers are often um, outward facing from a school in a way that sometimes academic leaders are not. And so they have a sense of trends um, that are existing in a wider business operation sphere that can be helpful for academic leaders to know. So we've mentioned one, right? The great recession, the great resignation. We haven't even touched on like higher inflation and what that might mean for schools or other macro trends that are out there. To me, that's a natural place for collaboration between the business office and academic leaders 
um, more academic leaders can get a window into something that's happening that's going to impact them or is impacting them, but doesn't feel immediate in terms of the classroom or uh, curricular needs. Yeah, I mean, I would say, Brad, uh, you and I are unique in that we began our careers as teachers and grew into more business leadership roles. The reality is a lot of our school business leaders um, didn't come uh, from the teaching profession. They didn't rise up the ranks in that regard. In a lot of cases, CFO roles in schools, it's a second career profession. They come yeah. from a different industry. They may have gained their school experience by being a trustee or another way, uh, another way in. And so academic leaders um, helping um, school business leaders understand the mission, the culture, the program, uh, is key to it, uh, key to the partnership and key to key to the overall school success. Well, James, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. I know that we will have you and your colleagues from the OA back regularly to share continued thoughts with academic leaders in independent schools. So thank you, everybody. Take care.